Philip of Macedonia reigned from 359 to 336 BC. He became the head of an empire that was expanded by his son and successor, Alexander the Great. In 357, Philip successfully faced off with Athens for control of the strategically located city of Amphipolis. Over the next two decades, Philip would achieve a series of victories in the region. At Chirini in 338, Philip's army fought against a large assembly of Greek forces. Using a faint retreat that created openings for his cavalry, Philip won a great victory over the Greeks. In consequence, he was able to form the League of Corinth in 337, which brought almost all of the Greek city-states into an alliance that was beholden to Philip. In October 336, King Philip of Macedonia was killed in the theater of Ica by Pausanias, one of his bodyguards. Although it was obvious that the assassin had a personal grudge, there are indications that other people were involved, or knew what was about to happen. Having stationed horses at the gates, he presented himself at the entrance to the theater with a Celtic dagger concealed about his person. When Philip instructed the friends who were escorting him to enter the theater in front of him and the bodyguards were standing somewhat apart, Pausanias, seeing that the king was alone, rushed forward and, driving the blow right through the ribs, laid him out prostrate and lifeless. Then he sprinted for the gates and the horses he had made ready for his escape. Some of the bodyguards immediately rushed to the king's corpse while others, including Leonatus, Perdiccas and Attalus streamed out in pursuit of the killer. Alexander the Great was just 20 years old in 336 BC, when he emerged as king of Macedonia, following the death of his father, Philip. For 12 years, Alexander's army swept aside rival empires in Persia and Egypt in a rapid eastward expansion. While still on campaign, Alexander died at age 32, in 323 BC. Numerous theories regarding his end include typhoid fever, malaria, alcohol and food poisoning, or an autoimmune disorder. Not once do any of the historical sources mention vomiting or even nausea as one of Alexander's symptoms. So what did kill Alexander? According to the historical accounts, Alexander had performed the divine sacrifices those prescribed for good fortune and others suggested by the priests. Each day he was carried on his couch to perform the customary sacrifices, and after their completion he lay down in the men's apartments until dusk. During this time he gave instructions to his officers about the coming expedition and sea voyage, for the land forces to be ready to move on the fourth day, and for those sailing with him to be prepared to cast off a day later. He was carried thence on his couch to the river, where he boarded the boat and sailed across to the garden where he rested again after bathing. He had a high fever that night another day as well. All the next day and for another day as well. This information comes from the royal diaries, where we also learn that the soldiers wanted to see him, some hoping to see him before he died and others because there was a rumor that he was already dead, and they guessed that his death was being kept back by his personal guard. Alexander had no heirs and following his demise, his new empire was divided up among the top generals. According to ancient reports, the king's body was first buried in Memphis, Egypt, and then moved to Alexandria. After his death, many believed Alexander was a god and came to worship at his tomb. There is a reference to Alexander's body being moved to Alexandria around 280 BC. Also mentioned is a memorial building constructed to house the body. Alexander had requested to be referred to as the son of Zeus Ammon and did not wish to be buried alongside his father Philip at Ega. According to early historians, when Alexander died suddenly in 323 BC in Babylon, his body was mummified, like the pharaoh he was, and placed in a gold coffin to be taken to see what. However, his wish was not honored. The funerary part with Alexander's body was hijacked in Syria by one of his generals, Historians have recorded that Alexander's generals were fighting for two years over whom would take his body and what would be done with it. Some wanted his body to be buried in Macedonia. Although the final resting place of Alexander the Great is one of history's most enduring mysteries, we do know that many of the kingdom's rulers were buried in Aegea. In fact, Aegea is best known today for its royal tombs, although there are many other archaeological remains at the site as well. The Macedonian capital was Agate, which may be translated to mean goats.
which is appropriate considering that the main economic activity of the Macedonians during that period was animal husbandry. Aga is located on a plateau on the eastern foot of the Hermito Mountains, on the southern edge of the Haleokman Plain, about 75 kilometers to the southwest of Thessaloniki, the second largest city of Greece. The Royal Necropolis is one of the most important archaeological remains at Aga. More than 500 tumuli, dating to between the 11th and 2nd centuries BC, have been identified, while three royal burial clusters have been excavated by archaeologists over the decades. While Agate has yet to be completely excavated, other important monuments that have been unearthed include the Monumental Palace, the City Walls, and the Theatre. The three great tombs of the Royal Tumulus at Virginia were excavated by the Greek archaeologist Manilus Andronikos. It was announced to the world that tomb II belonged to Philip. One of the pieces of evidence used to support this claim is a pair of Greek's armor that protected the legs that are of different lengths. This showed that the armor was custom made for a person who had legs of different lengths. In more recent times, the claim has been reassessed and it has been argued the Philip was in fact buried in tomb one. The left bone of the male in tomb one is shown to have sustained an injury which would have left its owner crippled for life. This would have agreed with the ancient sources, which state the fillet was injured in his leg. Tomb 1 also contained the remains of a young woman about 18 years of age identified as Philip's seventh wife, Cleopatra, and an infant child. It has also been claimed that Tomb 2 contained the remains of Aridus and Elder half-brother of Alexander the Great and his wife, Eurydice. At least according to the Greek scholar Triantaphilos D. Papazo is, the conqueror of the world should no longer be sought as he has been done over the centuries, in Egypt, Alexandria or the oasis of Siwa, but is before our eyes to Virginia, ancient capital of the Kingdom of Macedonia, 70 kilometers from Thessaloniki. In the large tomb believed to contain the remains of Philip, we find the body of the son who was transported to Virginia under the reign of Antigonus Gunnatus, who ascended the throne in 277 BC, tells the answer Papazo is historian and general former professor of military strategy. That there is no Philip 382 to 336 BC in the tomb of Virginia is not the isolated hypothesis of a scholar but a widespread opinion among experts. The paleoanthropologist Antonis Barbco Ocas has demonstrated thanks to the analysis of the bones that they have no peculiarities or wounds attributed by historians to the Macedonian king. Almost everyone agrees on my conclusions, says the scientist and there is broad consensus also on the fact that the objects, including the armor of iron and gold, found in the tomb are of a later generation than that of Philip, and probably belong to Alexander. Tomb 3 was also found unbooted, with a silver funerary urn that contained the bones of a young male, and a number of silver vessels and ivory reliefs. The king's body was cremated on a huge funeral pyre wearing a gold oak leaf crown with eight urns. Precious oils and fruit were thrown onto the pyre, and horses and many other types of animals were sacrificed and their bodies also thrown into the flames. One huge display shows examples of all of the different types of things found amongst the ashes of the pyre. His bones were then washed in red wine, wrapped in the purple cloth, covered with the oak leaf crown and then placed in a gold casket called a larnix. The casket was laid on a wooden couch decorated with gold and ivory figures and scenes and placed in the inner part of the tomb. The wood of the couch for the most part rotted away long ago, leaving the decorative figures. The king was buried with his weapons, a range of swords and spears, a huge shield, his suit of armor, and a large quantity of silver and gold jugs, dishes and plate. The quality of the workmanship in the silver and gold metalworking is just stunning and they look as if they have just been made not been lying in the ground for over 2,500 years. Most breathtaking of all is the work of the goldsmiths who made the royal crown, the work is so delicate and intricate. In the outer chamber of the king's tomb, was found a larnix containing the remains of a woman, possibly his wife, who sacrificed herself on his pyre. The larnix also had in it the remarkable gold crown of what looks like myrtles. In addition there is a further tomb that has been suggested is that of the Prince Alexander, son of Alexander the Great. The entrance to the tomb is similar to that of the king's but smaller and with no painting over the façade. The prince's remains were placed in a large silver jug and a large, gold, oak leaf crown placed over its neck. 
Ivory work is a specialized branch of sculpture. It consists of small reliefs which adorned wooden couches. Examples of this art have been found in Macedonia in the royal tombs of Virginia. In the king's tomb there was a group of small heads in relief, some of which may represent members of the royal family Philip, Alexander or Olympius. The direct comparison of the Walters head with large-scale photographs of the Virginia head shows striking similarities in the physiognomy of the features. The upswept hair falling back from the low, furrowed forehead, the large deep-set eyes with upward gaze, and the full lips conform to the descriptions of Alexander the Great and two other known representations of him. All in the moment through the gloom were seen 10,000 banners rise into the air with orient colors waving, with them rose a forest huge of spears, and thronging helms appeared, and serried shields in thick array of depth immeasurable, anon they move in perfect phalanx to the Dorian mood of flutes and soft recorders, such as break too hype of no love temper heroes old arming to battle, and instead of rage deliberate allard breast, firm and unmob with dread of death to flight or foul retreat, nor wanting power to mitigate and swage with solemn touches, troubled thoughts, and chase anguish and doubt and fear and sorrow and pain from mortal or immortal minds, thus they breathing united force with fixed thought moved on in silence to soft pipes that charmed their painful steps o'er the burnt soil, and now advanced in view, they stand, the whorehead front of dreadful length and dazzling arms, in guise of warriors old with ordered spear and shield, awaiting what command their mighty she had to impose. The sun was sunk, and after him the start of Hesperus, whose office is to bring twilight upon the earth, short arbiter twixt day and night, and now from end to end night's hemisphere had veiled the horizon round. See he had search and lands from Eden over Pondus, and the pool Mollies, up beyond the river Obi, downward his fair Antarctic and in length west from Orontes to the ocean barred at Darian, thence to the land where flows Gangs and Indus. Thus the orb he roamed with narrow search, and with inspection he considered every creature, which of almost opportune might serve his wells, and found the serpent subtlest beast of all the field. Pleasing was his shape, and lovely, never since of serpent kind lovelier, not those that in Illyria chopped Hermion and Camus, or the god in Epidaurus nor to which transformed Ammonian Jove, more Capitoline was seen, he with Olympius, this with her who bore Scipio the height of Rome, with tractably at first, as one who sought access, but feared to interrupt, sidelong he works his way, as when a ship by skillful steersman brought night river's mouth or foreland, where the wind bores oft, as oft so steers, and shifts her sail. I, at Eleusis, saw the finest sight, when early morning's banners were unfurled, from high Olympus, gazing on the world, the ancient gods once saw it with delight. Sad Demeter had in a single night removed her somber garments. And mine eyes beheld a broidered mantelline pale eyes throned o'er her throbbing bosom. Sweet and clear there fell the sound of music on mine ear. And from the south came Hermes, he whose lyre one time appeased the great Apollo's fire. The rescue made, Persephone, by the hand, he left to waving Demeter and cheer and light and beauty once more blessed the land. Bright gem of the Aegean, who will dare to ope the treasure thou hast given our kind, to take its measure, so beyond compare, and tell what thou hast meant for human mind,